If I make it through this intro all the way without laughing, that's an achievement. Today, we're going to talk about the magic of infrared with Troy Miller on Behind the Shot. Stop it, Troy. Hi, welcome to Behind the Shot. I'm Steve Brazel, and this is the show where we try and get inside the mind of great photographers by taking a closer look behind one of their shots from conception to completion, all the stories and challenges that happen in between. If you're looking for the show notes for this show or any show for that matter, head on over to the website. It's behindtheshot.tv. You can find me at stevebrazel.com and I'll give you all my socials as we go through the day too. They'll pop up as lower thirds. In fact, if you're watching the video, if you would like to subscribe to this podcast, the podcast is available in two different forms. So wherever you get your podcasts, if you search for behind the shot, You'll find an audio only version and a video version. Subscribe to the one that you want. I would like to ask a favor. Please do drop a star rating, drop a written rating. A five star rating would be great. If you don't think it's five stars, make sure you reach out to me. Let me know what you think I can improve on. I'd appreciate that very much as well. Uh, if you are watching this on YouTube, and by the way, if you tend to only have a podcast app that supports audio only and doesn't support video, head on over to the YouTube channel. And if you're watching on YouTube, please head down, click the subscribe button, the bell, all that stuff, you know, bang everything that's down there. One last thing I wanted to mention, the New Orleans workshop that we're doing, the uh, Wanderers Photo Workshop, that has been postponed due to things that have happened recently in New Orleans. But if you want to find some uh, details and information on that, just head over to wanderersphoto.com. It's been moved to January 23rd to 27th of 2022. Hope to see you there. Four instructors, four or three different genres, four instructors, New Orleans, Destination City, it's going to be a lot of fun. And last but not least, uh, the HD video is now for Behind the Shot, sponsored by my friends over at DVE Store. So to everybody at DVE Store, thank you. If you want more information on DVE Store, the place where you can get all your digital, digital video equipment needs, head to dvestore.com. They can get you set up. Both me and my guest today have bought stuff from DVE Store. So before I bring my guest on, I ran through all of that quick because... In my house right now, I'm sweating with this beanie on, but the beanie is on for a reason. And those of you on audio, I apologize. None of this is going to make any damn sense to you, but that's okay. So I got to tell you about my guest before I bring him on. And he's sitting right here and I can see his face and he's doing strange things, which is going to make this really hard. But years and years and years ago, I was at a dojo I train at and there was a photographer doing portrait photography and I did music photography, went up and introduced myself. It ended up the guy was the president of a local photo group, i.e. PPV. And he said, you know, we always get wedding photographers and portrait photographers and landscape photographers to do presentations at our monthly photo meetings. We've never had a music photographer. Would you like to do a presentation? So I go to i.e. PPV to do my presentation. And I did not know my guest, but then suddenly somebody walked up to me and said, hi, Troy. And I thought, okay, they just, you know, they, they misunderstood what my name was. Second person walks up to me and goes, hey, Troy. And I'm thinking, I'm not sure what's going on. And then I realized there is an actual guy named Troy. And Troy, like me, wears a beanie all the time. <laughs> Troy Miller, how are you? <laughs> I'm great. How are you, Steve? I'm good. Troy Miller has been my friend ever since that night. I consider him family. So to have him on yeah. this show with me, uh, it's hard to it, it's hard to overstate what it means, especially after a year of, and a half of pandemic, to see your right. face again, man. Not to mention a <laughs> beanie, but that's why I'm wearing the beanies because Troy also always wears the beanie, and I thought I'd do him the honor. Uh, how have you been? I've been good. Oh yeah, been good. Getting getting a little more busy now. Um, weddings are going to start to pick up, so we're doing some more sales and things. Where everything's pushed into next year, but that's just keeping us busy. So, okay. So I want to talk about you for a little bit before we get into the shot that we're going to do. And I mentioned at the beginning, we're going to talk about infrared today. But before we do, I got to right. talk about Troy a little bit. And I don't think I've ever said these things to you, so they're important to say. Because of knowing this guy right there, <laughs> that guy. Well, okay, that guy too. Because of knowing him, I started entering image competitions at, I joined IEPPV because of Troy. I ended up on the board of IEPPV because of Troy. I started entering image competitions because of Troy. I, what else? I started judging image competitions because of Troy. 
Uh, I started doing photography presentations because Troy introduced me and, and brought up my name to the people at Professional Photographers of California when they had their old, old uh, PPC Expo that they used to do in Pasadena back in, in days of lore. Um, what else? I uh, started doing workshops because of Troy. Really, a whole bunch of what I do is because of Troy. And that brings me to behind the shot. So originally, I was on a network that Troy's still involved with, TWIP, This Week in Photo. And when I left This Week in Photo, I, I remember this conversation like it was yesterday, man. I looked at Troy and I said, I'm done. I'm not doing it anymore. And Troy looked at me, again, remember this like it was yesterday, and said, no, 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 no. You have to do it. You have to do it on your own. The reason I do this podcast on my own in huge part is because of Troy and my wife telling me, no, 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 you don't want to stop. Keep doing it. So, uh, Troy, thank you for all of that. One of the biggest compliments that I can give you is I see images right now in my head differently than I did before I knew you. That Ooh. That's a big compliment as far as I'm concerned. So let's talk about you for a second. I just had to do that kind of personal intro. So <laughs> welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you. You are 15 minutes from me. You're Southern California based. Um, yep. I usually introduce you. You've been on the critique show before. And actually, you were one of my first guests here. You were one of the first five episodes that I recorded a shot called Stormy Kiss. Right. And uh, we recorded five episodes, or I did when I first started this podcast back in, I recorded them in the summer of 2016. I launched in December 2016. I think of you as a wedding photographer most of the time because that's how people talk about you. But you are a uh, fantastic fine art photographer. I've pushed you in into that myself at times. So I want to talk about your photography. Yeah. You make a living as a wedding photographer. Tell people about your company, your wife, and how this works. Uh, yeah. So uh, Margie, my wife and I, we've been full-time wedding photographers for 30 years. Um, that's pretty much all we've ever done. She actually bought me my first camera when we were in junior high. And uh, that was my fascination. And I got into photography from there. So, I mean, families and weddings, but weddings predominantly have been our sole uh, business drive for the last 30 years. And then aside from that, like I think most photographers, my hobbies are, you know, macro and fire and occasionally landscapes. And um, I'm obsessed with infrared. So that's. Well, well, and that's an interesting one. Two things. First of all, hi, Margie, if you watch this. Uh, yeah one of the most wonderful human beings that you will ever meet as, as is your daughter too. Imageryconcepts.com is the website where you do your wedding photography, but yes. your fine art photography you do through spicyjello.com. I do. What? Explain that. <laughs> um, so I, 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 I needed a, I needed to come up with a name that didn't exist and was kind of unusual. And I, I don't even remember the exact moment, but I thought, you know, what about what about like spicy pickles or spicy whatever or and spicy jello, spicy jello came out. And one of the rare circumstances where you go online and you go to look up a domain and it was available. <laughs> so, yeah. Ending and in a dot stuck. com. Yeah. 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 And it and it stuck. So and and I had it for probably three years before I even used it. And uh, and then I then I started using it. So now that's that's kind of the me side of my photography. And then the imagery concepts is really the Margie, the wedding side of our photography. So, well, your wedding photography, I'm going to get into in a second because you, you are an award-winning wedding photographer on many levels, but I want to touch on something you just said when you talked about, you know, you like macro and you do some landscapes and you like fire. When you go look at spicyjello.com, the fine art photography side of things, it's broken down into four categories, fire, mm -hmm. ice, water, kelp. Of course, my first exposure to infrared was you and I were out in the field. The first time I think was when we went out, you and I, we were at Photoshop World and Rick Salmon said, hey guys, you have a car, right? <laughs> I said, yeah. yes. Yeah. He goes, let's go catch the sunrise at Red Rock. I'm like, you know, cool. What, what time are we talking? He goes, pick me up at four, which to me is like death. <laughs> <laughs> we go out there, the gates rough. locked. We can't get into Red Rock. So we start driving around where the houses are out there. But you were, once the gate opened, we went in, you were shooting infrared. 
Yeah. And I started seeing them on the back of your camera. And then since then, you have a mirrorless infrared camera. And you can see it in real time on the EVF, which is interesting. Here's my question. Why those subjects? Fire, ice, water, kelp, infrared, that type of thing. You know, because they're intriguing to me. I mean, fire and water, uh, they behave very similarly. And they they have like a, they have their own personality. It's like fire has been said to be alive, right? The way that it behaves and it consumes and it moves. And then water is like serenity and it's quiet. I don't like to be in the water, by the way. I just like to photograph it. Um, and then and then infrared is a unique way at looking at the same things, but seeing them differently. And not just editing them differently. I mean, the world is full of infrared light, but we can't see it. So I get to see these subjects in a in sort of a magical way. So and that's infrared. I want to dive into that because is it is it the mystery of it? Because I, I I've been with you when you're shooting infrared. You see an infrared now. I know that you see an infrared. You'll say to me, that's going to come out like this and this and this. And it's real obvious you can, in your mind, you know what's going to be there, right, on an infrared shot. But is that part of it still, the mystery of what's going to happen? Yeah. It, so anybody who's been photographing for very long, I mean, visual light makes sense to us. Um, even if you're not photographing, visual light kind of makes sense. The way it reflects off the water or the, you know, we all know what a palm tree looks like or uh, grass or whatever, just in, in sunset light or morning light or afternoon light. But infrared, it's different. And it behaves differently. It reacts differently. Um, it bounces around the world differently. So even subjects that you would think are going to look similar, they they don't. And I'm still learning infrared. You, you, you still look at things completely different and realize like, oh my gosh, like this looks amazing. And in yeah. Infrared. And again, it's my first introduction to infrared was years and years ago with an old conversion that you had. And it intrigued me then, and I've never never converted a camera. I need to do that. Let, let's talk about your education side. Because again, I mentioned, and that's part of the reason I did that introduction, as long as it was, was because <laughs> your the fact that you do seminars, that w when we became friends you know, 100 years ago, and I, I saw you yeah. doing seminars and workshops and online classes and uh, F64 Live, things like that, your, your conference. When you started doing those things, or when I saw you doing those things, it, it intrigued me because you're a born educator to me. You have classes that you do now through This Week in Photo, Frederick Van Johnson's uh, network. Mm -hmm. You have a brand new one out, Capture One Complete. It's actually Capture One 21, version 21 complete for TWIP Pro right. members. Tell people not only about the class, but I'm just kind of curious about your approach to education as a whole. Because let me add this, as long as I've known you, it's it's not just a few people here and there that you share information with, right? You are so out there being, I've been at Photoshop World with you. We were sitting with Brad Moore at a table at uh, MGM Grand at a WPPI, and some of Brad's friends were across the table. Next thing I know, they're living in Montana or whatever, and they're emailing you questions because you're mentoring them. So tell me about your yeah. approach to education. Um. You know, being being a full time photographer and being a creative, I'm a full time creative, which means I, I all things creative are important to me. But but the photography side of it is is you know I've made my living in photography in something that I love in this industry, and I want to see this industry remain as healthy as possible. I want to be able to give back to the community, and and it can sound kind of corny, like oh you know I want to give back. You know I'm self taught. I didn't, I never didn't go to college to learn any of this. Um, I didn't go to any schools to learn this. I didn't go to seminars to learn this. I mean, I literally am, am self-taught. Heck, you barely and, know how to use a computer mouse. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm getting better. I'm getting okay. better. Uh, but, you know, for me, it's, it's like, I just, I really want to see this industry be healthy and I want to be able to give as much experience and advice as I can because in reality, when I was growing up and I was learning in this industry, it was a very, there was a lot of protectivisms that a lot of photographers wouldn't yes. share. 
that still and exist, by the way. It does. It does. And and I think it's I think it's sad and pathetic that anybody would keep secrets because there are no secrets. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Share. And, you know, the, the tide lifts all mm-hmm. boats, right? The rising tide lifts all boats. And so that's my goal is I just want to I just want to help feed the industry as much as I can um, because I want to see it stay healthy. Uh, yeah. I think it's, it's an amazing industry. It's an amazing profession. And, and I think right now, I, I think the democratization of photography through phones and inexpensive cameras and the fact that the, the cheapest camera out there right now can take amazing photos. Um, I think that too many people complain about what that's doing to photography. Oh, it's flooded the market with crap, you know, shots. No, it's, it's made it so that anybody that really does have a creative bone in their body can try it. And I'm a firm believer that the arts make humanity better. So I think that's, yeah. I, I think you sharing with people like that uh, is an amazing thing. Our, our mutual friend, Adam L. Micaiah said to me once when I asked him about exposure, his exposure on a shot, he was on the show about something. And I mentioned that so many people won't tell me like, they're like, no, no, no. Cause nobody's going to be able to take my exif data and make the exact same shot. And I'm like, yeah, but people that are learning Lightroom still need a preset here and there to understand what the things do. If it's a baseline starting point and Adam's response was, does somebody have a copyright on their F spot F stop? I'm like, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So yeah. as people will be able to tell from this video, uh, you have really good, set up here. You've got an SM, uh, B, SM seven B mic. You've got a mix pre three. I know you're shooting off a nice camera. You got nice lighting. You got some weird color behind you. I don't know where <laughs> you get that idea from, but you do a lot of stuff because you are doing stuff. You do the critique shows with Frederick Van Johnson for Twip Pro. Mm-hmm. Uh, you do the classes for them. When you see education move into the online space, what is your balancing point in your mind between I prefer to see somebody on a stage doing, you know, like you, for example, doing a live seminar versus doing an online seminar? Do you see any benefits or, or negatives to either? Um, n- no, I mean, it, that's a that's a complex question. Um, I kind of see like I, I kind of see Zoom and doing things virtual exactly like sitting in a room watching somebody on stage. Okay. Because I can't interact. The only thing I can do is like when you and I are at like Photoshop world and we're sitting next to each other, we're like, well, that's a crap example. You know, we can, we can talk crap with each other. Um, but in reality, I can't interact with the guest. So, or the, or the, or the, or the instructor. Presenter. So yeah. yeah, with the presenter. So except really Renee, kinda... except Renee, we did <laughs> Renee Robin. Well, she interacted with you. Long story. Won't go there. Go ahead. Oh yeah, uh, she called me out on a bad sky swap uh, yes. at WPPI on microphone. And I love, I love Renee, and it's it's been an ongoing uh, inside joke for a long time. But that's that's the thing. You have to come hang out with us to learn the story. Um, so I I really see education as uh, super important. That one, we need the talking head, we need the class, the lecture, which is what kind of what you can do on Zoom or what you can do from stage. But I also think that you know getting hands on. Uh, is is so mega important, and and I think in, in in photography especially that you need to find a mentor, whether it's it's at a class and somebody can hand show you how to set up lighting and how to pose somebody, or you can go shoot a wedding with a photographer and they can teach you the ropes. You know that mentor. You need that in person. So it's it's really those two things combined. I I don't think that watching a lecture on stage or watching Zoom is any different. No. And you and I now do something for IEPPV once a month where we have either a guest or the one that we're recording, uh, what we're recording this end of September and October 6th, you and I are going to be the people doing the presentation or chat uh, with IEPPV on just event photography in general. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree. So let me ask you this then let's, let's get into infrared photography. First of all, explain to people why it's different. Um, so light is made up of many spectrums of, of light. There's infrared, there's ultraviolet, there's a visual spectrum that we can see as, as humans. 
animals, insects, reptiles, they all see different spectrums of light. But just just know that in, in, in the light that's like striking the ground, there's light in there that our brains, our eyes cannot register, we cannot collect. But instruments can. And so uh, a digitally converted, a camera that's converted to infrared can pick up some visual light. Well, we can talk about like conversions if you want later, but um, but basically it becomes sensitive to infrared light, which our eyes don't see. And that's the magic is that we're able to capture that world that we can't, our eyes cannot see, but it's there. It's like, it's like, an, it's like another layer, right? It's like another dimension. It's right there. From a human point of view, it's an invisible world, right? It, it, it is. really yeah. is. And the, the way I describe it to people often is I, I think people understand audio frequencies. They understand, you know, that dogs hear a different a sound or can hear a dog whistle and we can't. And it's that same kind of a concept only with visual right. light. So you mentioned IR conversions. We could go in a rat, rabbit hole here for an hour on this, but right. there are different when, if you send your camera in, which is how you get it converted, you send it to a company right. that converts your sensor to pick up IR. There are different conversions that you can do. Sure. So explain to me kind of the variance there. What it, how did you get yours converted? Um, there's a bunch of places to get them converted. So you can do a search online. I personally use Spencer's camera out of Utah. Clarence is the owner there. He's done all my conversions. Um, there's, there's, there's many others, uh, but whoever's going to convert it for you, what's important is, is that you, you look at the conversion styles and it's easier for you to go look these up. So if you go to spencerscamera.com, um, he has an infrared conversion chart there that actually shows you what it's called. So there's like amplified color, extreme color, and they tend to talk about conversions in nanometers. And that's the wavelength of light. Do you have the website in front of you right now? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Just without sharing it, what's the URL? And I'll put it in the show notes and I'll add, I don't have a lower third prep for this, but I, I will do so. What is the, the URL for Spencer's right now? It's spencerscamera.com. Okay. Spencerscamera.com. Dot com. Yeah. Yeah. And I may even okay. have a promo code if I can, if I can find it, I'll send that to you as well. And you can include that. Um, but what's going to happen is, is that you're going to go look at these things. You're going to get a little confused and that that's, that's normal. Is it? You're like, Oh gosh, do I want like normal, normal infrared or do I want like extreme infrared or do I want, you know, so just to give you a sense, I do all my conversions at 720 nanometers, which they consider to be a standard color infrared conversion. Okay. And where that difference is really going to come down to is how much of the visual light spectrum it will pick up versus how narrow of a visual light spectrum it will pick up. So it pick up all the infrared, but how much of the visual spectrum? And this matters because I can shoot in normal light and I can still make a good image. And that's important to me that I can do that. Uh, but if I have a, a really narrow infrared spectrum, then I can't shoot in like right. soft light, like after the sun sets and stuff like that, like or, or in a room where there's no infrared light. So, so I have a question then. Since we can't see the light, again, I've been out shooting with you and you look at a scene and go, that's it. I'm shooting that. Yeah. If you can't see the infrared light, how do you plan? So we need the special gear. We need the, the sensor conversion. But how do you plan for the scene as a whole or the composition if you can't see it, uh, you have to pre-visualize, you know, Ansel Adams was the pioneer of pre-visualizing your shot. Um, thinking of it in your head before you press the shutter. And this isn't just for infrared. This is for everything that we do, but it's, it's experience. You have to go out and you have to shoot and you have to get used to your camera. You have to get used to what the sky is going to look like, what the clouds are going to look like, what grass is going to look like. Um, you just have to pre-visualize it. And the okay. more you shoot, the more experience you get. That makes sense. All right. So I want to get into the photo. The photo that we're going to talk about today, if you're listening to the audio only version, make sure you head to the website. It's behindtheshot.tv. You can also see it in the video. If you have a podcaster podcast catcher app that does not support video, go on over to YouTube. You can see it there in the YouTube channel. But if you go to the website, you'll see it down 
at the bottom in a small gallery. I've got like 10 shots of Troy's up there, some black, some black and white infrareds. I've got some color wedding shots up there as well. This photo is called Moonrise Over Hearst Castle. And I have to say right up front, because I, I grew up going to Hearst Castle. It's in Southern California out on the coast area in San Simeon. This is one of my favorite infrared shots ever. And I've asked you to talk about this shot on the show for quite a long time. So let, let's start here. Let's start with the technical stuff, since this is kind right. of a technical topic. And by the way, those of you used to seeing the show, the background here is gray because there's so much black in this image. I wanted you to, to see where the top of the image ended. Yeah. You shot this in aperture priority mode on yes, a Nikon. Aperture. Okay. Nikon D7000, which is a 1.5 crop sensor. It's an APS-C sensor. Uh, matrix metering. The, the exposure information is interesting to me here. So first of all, you're at one twelve fiftieth of a second. Right. 200 millimeters effective, uh, F7.1, or not effective, 200 millimeters on the lens, F7.1, ISO 100. Because you're an aperture priority, you then dialed your exposure compensation down minus two. And again, the lens, by the way, is an 800 to 400 lens, but with this being 200 millimeters on a 1.5 crop body, the effective range here is 300 millimeters. So let me start with, if you were going to underexpose by two stops and you're already at ISO 100, right? So you're not going to go anywhere from there. You're at 1250th and 7.1. Why do an exposure compensation down? Why not just change the aperture or change the shutter? Because I don't shoot in manual. I always shoot in aperture priority. Um, but you could have raised your aperture up. Uh, but it wouldn't have changed the exposure. If I would have raised the aperture, I would have just oh, gotten- it would have you know, auto-adjusted everything, yeah. 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 Okay. So the the camera is sensitive to infrared light. And, and this is this is where sort of the challenges with exposure and stuff come in, is um, the cameras are dialed in to meter visual light, not infrared light. And the moment that they're converted to infrared light, they're still metering visual light. So, oh, so hold on, just... hold on. So you're telling me when you, oh, that makes total sense. So the sensor reads infrared, but all the metering gear hasn't been changed. It's still metering right. standard right. light spectrum. Oh, right. yeah. Ooh. Yeah. See the lights going off now. Yeah, actually it is. Okay. I <laughs> yeah. get it. I totally, it makes total sense. Yeah. Yeah. So to the, to the camera, anything that has infrared light in it, which is the moon and that foreground coming back into the camera, it's extra sensitive to that infrared light. So the camera doesn't know, but pre-visualizing the shot, I know the camera is going to be sensitive to that. So I'm always just rolling the compensation up or down where I want it to go. Okay. So for those of you on the audio feed, I am going to describe this shot. And there's, there's one part of this shot that's fascinating that I'm, uh, we'll get into it at the end. Picture a black and white landscape. It looks like this is pitch dark nighttime and you're doing infrared like a security camera, right? Like it's nighttime and you're kind of getting the hills to light up and the moon to light up. Rolling hills in the foreground, mountains in the background and sitting just past the foreground rolling hills but in front of the mountains is Hearst Castle, which is a giant castle, uh, Hearst Corporation. William Randolph Hearst built this, obviously, and uh, owner of Hearst Media originally. Um, the top of the mountains, let me, let me add this, by the way, where Hearst Castle is on the mountain range, like based on where you move, that castle is in a really nice spot against one of the bigger mountains that's in the background. But the top of the mountains... This is what I think is really cool about the composition in this shot. The entire landscape area stops at the lower third. So the highest peak on the highest mountain behind the rolling hills is at the lower third. The moon is on the upper rule of third. And most two thirds of the shot are sky at that point. But here's the thing. And the sky is all dark again, like it's nighttime. 
The moon is almost full. The moon is almost exactly, by the way, this this is almost a 16.9 widescreen crop. It's very close to 16.9, um, a little bit wider than that. The moon is on the upper left rule of third. The largest mountain peak and the castle are on the right rule of third. But again, the castle is a little bit below it because the top of the mountains lines up with the, the horizontal rule of third at that point. The shot is infrared. The grass and the trees, I don't know how to describe this. They look different. They look normal, but they don't look normal, but they kind of look normal. It's kind of like you're on a foreign planet type normal. And again, looks like nighttime, but it's not, correct? Right. No, it's not nighttime. No, it's it's the blue sky. Yeah. So when what time of day was this? Uh, it's like three o'clock in the afternoon. So let's start there. How does three o'clock in the afternoon look like nighttime? Well, this is the amazing thing about infrared. Knowing that the camera is sensitive to infrared light, um, the infrared is bouncing off the foreground, the hills, the little the mountain range there, Hearst Castle, and infrared light is reflecting off the moon because that's sunlight. Now the sky is uh, full of ultraviolet and there's no infrared light. So it's very desensitized to the sky. So the sky naturally goes dark because there's no light, infrared light, coming into the sensor to create an image, right? So it naturally wants to go dark. And so the, the moon here would have been dim, right? Like date, like three uh, o'clock in the afternoon moon. Yeah, it, it, funny thing is when I took this shot, I didn't actually know Hearst Castle was there. I didn't see Hearst Castle originally. Um, I just Wait, saw, what? I just saw, yeah. So I didn't, I didn't actually know that Hearst Castle was in there when I first took the shot. I just saw this cool mountain range in the moon and I went, oh, I wonder. And I lifted up the camera and infrared. I went, oh my God, I can see the moon and I can see the mountain range. And I'm just like, I'm shooting, I'm shooting. I get making sure it's in focus and doing all the things. And then later I saw Hearst Castle was in there. Um, but that's the wonderful thing is that a lot of people don't think about shooting the moon during the day. Right. Because everything's bright. The moon doesn't really stand out, but not an infrared. I mean, college fraternity guys shoot the moon during it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you've been doing IR for a long time now. You've learned to know what will work and what won't without seeing it to help people that decide to try this. Is there any miscon you know, common misconception of, oh, I'm going to shoot this and then they do and go, oh, that didn't work at all? Is there any common one that you can warn people about? Um, th th there's a couple things. One, a lot of people that shoot infrared think that you're just going to color balance it and that's what infrared looks like. And that's, that's the colors that are in an infrared image. There's actually magenta and cyan um, if you white balance your image. A lot of people stop there. And I think that that's kind of a bummer because that's a look that's great. But when you start converting them to black and white, that's where the magic really comes in. And by the way, you know, editing an infrared image is not necessarily easy um, for Why? the most part. Well, when you bring them into the into the computer, they're, they're bright magenta, they're bright red, or they might even be purple, depending on the conversion style. Um, and they, they can be flat. Some of them can be really flat. And so you have to go in, you have to color correct, and you have to separate the tones a little bit. It, it takes a little bit of effort to kind of get the magic out of that thing, get the best image out of it. Okay. So when you shot this, a D7000 was a an APS-C crop right. sensor, Nikon body, DSLR. You're guessing right? You've got to shoot it and then look. Now you've got mirrorless conversions and you have an EVF. Does the EVF accurately show you what you're going to need? I mean, because most people, if they wanted the cheapest conversion, like I have a 5D Mark III that I'm about to sell, I guess I could send that in and have it converted. Advantages, disadvantages, DSLR versus mirrorless in this world? Yeah, so a DSLR is really the the hardest way to do an infrared conversion. Um, one, you can calibrate a lens because infrared focuses at a different distance. 
And so all of our cameras are, are calibrated to focus in visual light. So you can't just convert it and throw any lens on it. It won't focus properly. Everything will be out of focus. So you have to calibrate a single lens. If you don't want to calibrate a single lens, then you have to shoot through live view. So the, the D7000, I had to shoot everything through the, the live view on the back, which is which is awful because it's bright. There's reflections. I can't really see the image properly. Um, that's where mirrorless comes in is because technically it's live view all the time and I don't have to calibrate a lens. I can use anything I want because it's actually cali it's actually focusing directly off the sensor. So that's just really important to know. So DSLRs are hard to do. So I always tell everybody, um, the first camera you convert is going to be the one that you give away because you're going to fall in love with it and then just go convert a good camera. Go go get a mirrorless body and and convert that. So um, what is, this was a D7000. What, what's your current IR body? Um, a Nikon Z6 okay. that I've Ooh, converted. Nice yeah. body to convert. So I've converted a D800, a D850. Um, I've, I've gone through the, the set. And by the way, you can unconvert a camera. A lot of people don't oh. realize that, uh, they, they take the filter off the sensor. They replace it with an infrared filter. Basically it just filters out everything except infrared light or somewhere in there, whatever the nanometer range is. If you want to unconvert it, you just send it back like to Spencer's and say, Hey, put it, put it back to normal. And I think Spencer's charges like half to convert it back as he did to convert it. And average conversion is like three, 350. That's what I was just going to ask. What does it cost to convert? When you say average, does it vary based on the camera or? Yeah, it does. Um, and I don't know why it, it could just be the difficulty to get in there. Like I'm not a technician. I don't know. Um, but it's, it's roughly in the 300, $350 range. And when I converted my D850 and I wanted to sell it, I tried to sell it as an infrared. Nobody wanted it. So I just sent it in, had it, had it converted back to normal, which is great because it's still under warranty and like nobody knows I did it. Um, right. He, he does a great job. I mean, he does conversions for like NASA and stuff like this guy knows his stuff. Okay. So, so it is a regular camera. Composition wise, I already kind of talked about this. The moon on the upper left rule of third, the mountains on the lower rule yep. of third castle below that. It's actually about a 16 by eight, three, eight dot three, uh, wide screen kind of ratio on this that really showcases the sky, which works here because it sets Having that much dark sky sets out all of those nice rolling hills that you've got going on. Mm -hmm. Interesting that when you shot this, you couldn't see the castle, but let's talk about post. So when you do do post on an infrared, a shot like this, you bring in, what software do you use today to process infrared? And is it the same as what you would do with color shots? Yeah, it's the same software. So I use uh, Capture One. It's my favorite editing software, as you mentioned, I think in the introduction that I have a course out for Capture One. I, I, I really love it. And for infrared, it's really powerful uh, without going into huge detail. And I think I actually have a YouTube video on, on how I do it. Um, but you, you, I, I use Capture One, you can color balance, you can get those two tones, the cyan and magenta separated a little bit, which allows me to choose what would be an infrared reflection and what's ultraviolet light. I can separate those and I can create a lot of contrast or a lot of tonality in, in the image uh, with that tool. They all work though, by the way. I mean, anything that's got a good white balance tool, you can do okay. it. Lightroom, no problem. Yeah, Photoshop, you don't have whatever. Special. Yeah, Photoshop, Camera Raw. Yep, they all work. What would you have done to this image? Um, like, what did I do to edit this particular image? Yeah, do you, do you remember? Um, yeah, so this image, this image you was swapped initially... out the sky. <laughs> sorry, again. <laughs> hi, Renee. No, sorry. Yeah, hi, hi Renee. Love you. Yeah, thanks. Um, <laughs> um, you no, know, so this image was originally pretty flat. And, and what I mean by that is like the, the tonality in the image was fairly flat. And I think that was just the conversion that I had on the D7000 at the time. And so I really had to work on separating the, the color, the color tones or the, the, the infrared, the foreground and the moon and the sky. Once I kind of got that white balance kind of figured out, then, then it was, then it was super easy. Okay. Uh, so Let's jump to speed round. Uh, 
love your IR stuff and people go check out more. I've been putting Troy's stuff up. And for those of you on the audio feed, I will mention how you can follow Troy at the, at the end of the show. And also all of Troy's links are in the show notes at behind the shot TV. They're also in the YouTube video, et cetera, et cetera. So speed round, answer these as fast as you want to. And let's see what happens. Number one tip for somebody just starting out in infrared photography. Oh, walk around with that thing stuck to your eyeball and point it at everything. It'll blow your mind. Okay. Top wedding photography tip. Oh, geez. <laughs> uh, find somebody to mentor you and and go do that. Okay. Second shoot would be a good thing. Second shoot. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Find okay. a mentor. Yeah. yeah. Favorite composition rule. Uh, the golden ratio. Okay. I, I love, I love how the golden ratio works. Inter you're the first person to ever say that. And I actually had somebody on the show that I mentioned the golden ratio and I mentioned the golden triangle. And this is a well-known, amazing photographer and didn't know what the golden triangle was. And I was like, oh, interesting. Just yeah. clearly this guy just sees in historical composition rules, which is awesome. A uh, favorite drink. Oh, any scotch. <laughs> any scotch. Okay. Any uh, scotch, yeah. Any scotch. So folks, if you're looking for Christmas gifts for Troy, any scotch. Favorite singer, band, or album? Or all three? Uh, Duran Duran, Girls on Film. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> yeah. That's, Are you being serious? It it's the first CD that I ever bought. It was, it's, it's ingrained in my DNA. Yeah. I've got a Dude, lot of you favorites. you live on Electronica. I really, I, I expected, do. I expected you to say, oh, Diplo or something. I don't know. You know, something more EDC like <laughs> that surprised me. Um, yeah. Okay. First concert ever. Oh, uh, Oingo Boingo on uh, Halloween. Seriously? Yeah. That could have been awesome. Yeah, right. we went five or six years after that, yeah. Best color beanie? Black. Okay, good. That is the correct answer. Okay. Uh, <laughs> there's there's people listening to this going, this is what odd. the hell? Yeah, yeah exactly. So I want to go to a totally different route here. Who is a photographer or artist or whatever that you think – not enough people know about, or maybe they do, but they just need to be mentioned again. Who's a photographer or artist that needs to be mentioned? Um, Steve Brazel. He's a, he's a pretty good photographer. He's better than he thinks he is. Um, and now I got to buy him a bottle of scotch. Damn. <laughs> okay. Uh, Galen Rowell. Um, He's, he was a landscape photographer, uh, shot film, was a pioneer at 35 millimeter, large, large prints, used to have a gallery up in Bishop. Um, he, he's amazing. And unfortunately, he passed away a long time ago. But Galen Rowell, Galen Rowell is an amazing landscape photographer and, and the industry okay, is good. sad for his loss. Yeah. So for people that want to follow Troy Miller, which trust me again, I've known this guy a long, long time and his, his imagery will inspire and surprise you. And I mean that with the, the, I don't even know how to word it other than it will inspire and surprise you. He'll put up a shot of fire one day, meaning his welding torch that he's photographing. He'll put up a macro shot of an ice cube the next day. And there was a day, I think we were at Photoshop World also for this one. And we're walking down the Las Vegas Strip. <laughs> and I, again, I'm a live music photographer and it's kind of all I see in my head. And we're walking down and I'm, I'm thinking, what can I shoot? I just don't see anything. And he, he is looking at a shadow on the ground from a wrought iron railing. And I'm thinking in my head, I, I, I don't get it. I don't understand what he's seeing right here. And yet when you see the picture, it's like, oh, I totally get it. So if you want to follow Troy Miller, uh, you can, there's two different websites, Fine Art Wedding, all the other stuff. So Troy, what are the two websites that people should know? 
um, spicyjello.com and imageryconcepts.com. You can we can see a bunch of work there. Okay. And if people want to find your Capture One class? Uh, you would go to Twip Pro. And I, I don't know how Frederick has it listed. I know he has a If, if you go to thisweekinphotography.com. Yeah, this week in photo, Or thisweekinphoto.com, yeah. uh, you'll find that there. Facebook uh, is the wedding side of things, Imagery Concepts. But Troy is on Instagram twice, Imagery Concepts and Spicy Jello. Yeah. I Twitter, don't for some reason, on... is the odd man out. And I'm going to ask yeah. you again. We understand Spicy Jello now on Instagram, but explain the Twitter handle. What's the Twitter handle? Is it pudding? No, Jones and Ader. <laughs> oh, Jones and Ader. Yeah, uh, it's an, I'm, a, I'm an old gamer, and uh, Jones and Ader was my was my gaming handle. That's what I use when I gamed. So I still use it. Okay. Oh, so you're still gaming? I know that because you've played with my kid online before too. I think. Uh, yeah. Again, dude, wonderful to see you. Please tell your family hello and thanks for doing this. I really appreciate it. Of course. Yeah, it's it's a blast. Yes, thank you. So everybody go follow Troy Miller. And again, thank you to my buddy, Troy Miller for doing behind the shot. Before we close out a couple of things, just to let you know about, first of all, again, if you uh, want some audio video type equipment, make sure that you head on over and check out DVE store, high def video provided by them. Thanks to the, to the guy and everybody over there as well. If you are watching on YouTube, head down, hit all the buttons. You see a button, hit the button. Whatever it is, just find it and hit it. If you want more information on this particular episode or any episode of Behind the Shot, go to the website. It's behindtheshot.tv. You can find me at stevebrazel.com. By the way, whatever your podcast catcher app is, please drop a review. Five-star rating would be great. If you don't think it's five stars, instead of dropping a review, reach out to me on social media. Let me know what it is you think I can improve upon. It's Behind the Shot TV on Instagram or Twitter or Steve Brazel on Instagram or Twitter. Other than that, to everybody, thanks as always for joining. This is Behind the Shot, the show where we try and get inside the mind of a great photographer by taking a closer look behind one of their shots, and we'll see you on the next show. 